Dr. Nardell is a pulmonologist with a special interest in tuberculosis. He trained in pulmonary medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital with additional research training at Boston University School of Medicine. While at Boston City Hospital, Dr. Nardell became the director of tuberculosis control for the city of Boston. In 1981, he became chief of pulmonary medicine and director of tuberculosis control for the city of Cambridge, positions that he held until 2005. His principal academic appointment is as associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School with secondary parallel appointments in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and Harvard School of Public Health. In the early 1980s, Dr. Nardell was also appointed medical director of tuberculosis control for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, a position that he held for 18 years. Dr. Nardell is currently conducting a research project in South Africa studying the transmission of MDR-TB using large number of guinea pigs to quantify the infectiousness of MDR-TB patients and the effectiveness of various control interventions, including ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. I will now turn you over to Dr. Edward Nardell. Thank you. Thank you, Yevgena, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well, and uh, let us know if you can. Um, so, as Evgena said, this is the first of three uh, talks on infection control. I know there have been other talks in this uh, series by uh, my close colleague uh, Grigory Polchenkov in Russian. Uh, obviously, this will be in English, and I hope to emphasize uh, slightly different aspects of infection control than Grigory did. Some of you may have heard me talk about some of this uh, previously. Um, it has been a a topic that I speak about fairly often. So today I, I'll, I'll remind you of the overall strategy of TB infection control and then hone in, uh, focus on administrative controls and in particular one aspect of um, administrative controls that have been made possible by my own uh, research in South Africa with my colleagues uh, in South Africa and around the world. So let me advance the slides here. So uh, as you know, uh, infection, con uh, infection control <coughs> has um, three uh, components to it. Uh, first, we speak of administrative controls, then environmental or engineering controls, and then finally, personal uh, respiratory protection. Um, the The advantages of administrative controls is that um, uh, the idea is to try and prevent exposure rather than trying to, to deal with the uh, organisms in the air, if you will, after exposure has occurred, which we then require uh, engineering or environmental controls. And finally, last on the, uh, on the list are respirators, which uh, really, uh, in some cases, may be the only infection control um, barrier uh, available, intervention available, but are always considered the last ditch because very often, as you'll hear, um, transmission occurs from unsuspected cases uh, or unsuspected drug resistance. And in those cases, because um, the disease is unsuspected, uh, you may not be wearing a respirator. So all the details around fitting fit testing, uh, and um, how to care for respirators are really irrelevant if you're not wearing one at the time of exposure. So going back to, again, to the beginning, um, we're going to talk about administrative controls, and in particular, a, a focus of uh, administrative controls, which I call the FAST strategy, based on the impact of effective treatment on TB transmission. So. Just to put us into context, the required statistics, uh, there has been estimated to be approximately 500,000 new MDR-TB cases per year. And uh, why am I emphasizing MDR-TB? 
Well, I think personally I consider it the greatest threat to tuberculosis control that we're facing globally. Uh, treating drug susceptible TB, although it takes still a long time, six months of treatment, uh, is, is relatively simple and relatively inexpensive in comparison to treating drug resistant TB. And we're not doing a very good job of that, treating uh, drug resistant TB. Um, first of all, mo most of these cases, or at least half of them, result from transmission. And uh, in 2008, for example, there were 30,000 cases reported, which is only 7% of the estimated cases. And uh, only 1% of those uh, estimated cases were treated with quality assured drugs. So most cases of MDRTB are going undiagnosed, and many of them are going uh, untreated with effective drugs known to be effective. Now globally, in many places, not all, patients are treated in the hospital for the first six months, often until culture conversion, which can ha happen before six months or, or after six months, but in general, um, that's a good, um, uh, some, a, a good estimate. And moreover, very often since treatment of MDRTB involves injectable drugs, canamycin or capriomycin, um, oftentimes that hospitalization coincides with the uh, time when injections are being given. Now, I will be making the argument that that probably isn't necessary, certainly not from an infection control perspective, but it may be necessary in many settings because the infrastructure for treating TB, uh, MDRTB in particular, on an outpatient basis may not be in place. That's been the case until recently, for example, in South Africa. Here pictured on the slide is the, the famous Church of Scotland Hospital uh, ward, typical ward in many parts of the world, um, South America, this happens to be KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, but a typical open ward. This was the site of the transmission of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, which um, we all read about in, beginning in 2006, and which really contributed to putting TB infection control on the front burner, if you will. In other words, it was neglected for many years. Suddenly, this outbreak with clear transmission of highly drug-resistant TB occurred, and then um, everyone was talking about infection control. To emphasize the um, problem of treating MDRTB in hospitals, I show you some data from Dr. Norbert Ninjeki, uh, from who's the director of drug-resistant TB in South Africa. And this data is a little bit old. He presented this a few years ago. Uh, but it, it emphasizes the point that what South Africa was facing. Here we see the, uh, I think, eight provinces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine provinces of South Africa. And the number of registered patients in, in 2008, again, not all of the patients. You can see that there are some provinces uh, registered very few patients. Uh, the available be beds and the fact that in 2008, there were close to 3,000 beds short of the number of beds needed. So regardless of whether um, or not one uh, wanted to do ambulatory treatment for MDRTB. Um, the bleak necessity, bleak figures here of, of, of too few beds indicated that it was really quite necessary to do so. At the same time, many places, uh, the organization that I'm affiliated with, Partners in Health here in Boston, working in Peru and Lesotho, and uh, other groups working in Cambodia, in KwaZulu Natal now uh, have begun treating MDRTB in the community. Uh, I think that this clearly provides less opportunity for institutional transmission, but what about community transmission? And this has been a major concern of many organizations considering treating MDRTB in the community. What about transmission if you're not in the hospital? I will make the case that number one, you're better off in the community because things are less crowded, but also I'll make the case that once effective treatment is started, that um, transmission is much less likely in the community. 
by the way, the uh, treatment of MDR-TB in Peru began in 1996. So we've had quite a bit of experience in the community treatment of MDR-TB beginning there. And, and it was a similar time in Cambodia, as far as I know. Uh, fast forwarding to the United States, even in a country with relatively little MDR-TB, you know, we had a resurgence between 1985 and, and uh, 19, uh, uh, 1985 and 1992 uh, in the United States, but that has largely gone away. And But we still have residual cases, sometimes born outside the United States, sometimes from the United States. And uh, a few years ago at CDC, uh, some of my colleagues here, um, particularly Jenny Flood from California, raised a question about when we could discontinue isolation for patients with MDR-TB. Do they have to stay in until their sputum converted? What were the guidance here? And so we, we did a literature search, and, and, and I, I'm, what I'm going to show you now are the, uh, some guidelines from uh, resource-rich countries, by and large, of how long TB needs to be treated, first drug-susceptible TB and then drug-resistant TB. So if one looks at discontinuation of airborne isolation, drug-susceptible TB, two references from the CDC, 2005, from the UK Department of Health, New York City Bureau of Tuberculosis Control, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. And you'll see that the minimum day's treatment uh, is, 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 is fairly consistent. 14 days, two weeks. Some of you have, may have heard uh, or remember that after two weeks, supposedly, patients are no longer infectious. I'm going to tell you where that data came from in a little while, and you'll see that it is, um, it is probably a reliable number, but probably is uh, way longer than necessary, as you'll see. Uh, in some cases, people look for three negative smears um, or not. Now, I have to mention that discontinuation of airborne isolation for drug-susceptible TB, we don't need to admit every patient with drug-susceptible TB to the hospital. So in some sense, it's a little bit um, ironic to speak of when you can let patients out of the hospital if they didn't have to be in in the first place. So uh, take this 14 days with a grain of salt. I think what it means is that if they are in the hospital, you really shouldn't have patients wandering around while they're infectious. And the question is, how long does it take for them to be infectious? The literature focuses around this 14 days. Again, I'll show you where that came from. For MDR-TB, the same sources are listed, but you'll see that there really are no minimum days of treatment. And this comes from the fact that in that 1985 to 92 experience that we had, particularly in New York City, there was transmission of MDR-TB between patients, many of whom had HIV, and also to healthcare workers. And people had perhaps been following the 14-day rule. And when that happened, when transmission occurred, they said, wow, this 14-day rule doesn't apply to MDR-TB. But in fact, what happened is in most cases, those patients were being treated for drug-susceptible TB, but actually had MDR-TB. So the, uh, in fact, they were not actually being treated effectively. So, but nonetheless, out of that experience came a big question mark uh, of, of, of how long patients need to be treated before they can be discharged from the hospital or from isolation, I should say. So there is a rich literature. And I'm not going to go through all of these studies, but I will mention some of them. And they begin with the Madras study of uh, ambulatory treatment in 1960. Remember that in 1946, 47, we had our first uh, drugs, uh, streptomycin, and INH in around 52 or so. So that by 1960, um, the treatment for tuberculosis, by and large, was isoniazid, uh, PAS, and streptomycin. And Andrews and a group from the British Re Research Council, I believe, um, did a, a, a control trial of, of treating patients at home versus in the hospital in Madras, India. 
And it's on that basis that we treat patients on an ambulatory basis. So they were the first to show that it could be done. Um, there were a number of studies in the United States in 73, 74, 76 uh, is a summary of many of these uh, patients, uh, of many of these uh, uh, studies. And this is by Anique Rion, who was a scientific director at the Union uh, in the late 70s. And she and her colleagues put together a review paper on the impact of treatment on transmission. And to jump to the uh, conclusion just before I get to the details, and what they found was that smear and culture correlated with uh, infectivity only in untreated cases. That there was a discordance between the effect of treatment on culture and smear and on infectivity. Uh, evidence that smear and culture t uh, positive TB patients on therapy do not infect skin test negative close contacts. Now, I will mention in passing um, an article, you can find it, by uh, Dick Menzies from Montreal, where he takes issue with the, these observational studies and says, except for this first one, all of these were just observational. They weren't placebo-controlled trials, and therefore subject to bias. And he isn't so sure that these papers indicating rapid effect of, of, of treatment on transmission are as um, clear as uh, some of us believe. So going, skipping ahead to the Madras study, um, first clinical trial of inflammatory TB treatment demonstrated no more household conversions after the start of treatment. That is, that uh, if patients were started from the beginning in the household versus being treated for as long as a year in the hospital, the number of people in the household who um, became infected was no different. And um, you could argue that most household contacts had already been exposed for months before the diagnosis and treatment started. Therefore, most were, those who were going to get infected were already infected. The susceptible ones were already infected. And um, by the time uh, you know, the uh, patients uh, were no longer infectious, uh, there was really, um, this is the other conclusion, that patients were no longer infectious after treatment started. Um, Riley and Moody in 1974 studied 70 household contacts um, of 65 new TB cases on home treatment. These were non-rifampin-based regimens. They were ne never hospitalized. And a series of six skin tests were done, showing no transmission among 25 PST negative contacts after the start of treatment. So starting patients at home, um, that if they weren't infected from the beginning, much like Madras showed, they didn't get infected once treatment started. And, if, and as you know, smear and culture doesn't convert immediately. It takes a, a while. It may take two months before uh, the smear becomes negative. So something happens with treatment that prevents transmission, even though uh, uh, they are maybe smear or culture positive, emphasizing the point of um, Dr. Rayun, um, Anik Rayoun that there's a discordance between the effect of treatment on uh, transmission and the effect of treatment on the smear and culture. Another similar study, Gunnels, studied the contacts of 155 patients sent home after one month of treatment. 69 were sent home culture negative, 86 were sent home culture positive, of which 52 were smear and culture positive. Again, no difference among 284 contacts of the culture positive cases versus 216 contacts of the culture negative cases, again suggesting either that all the infected people who were going to get infected had already become infected, or treatment had a very rapid impact on transmission. In any case, it was clearly safe to treat people in the community, even though they're smear positive, because um, no further transmission occurs, which has been the fear. So again, uh, Nick Rion and her colleagues in Tubercle in 1976 summarized this data. 
And um, to repeat, sputum smear and culture positivity correlate with transmission before treatment, but not on therapy. Uh, and evidence that smear and culture positive patients do not infect close contacts. Finally, the point I've been trying to get to, and I'm going to read this quote verbatim, there is an ever-increasing amount of evidence to support the idea that the evolution of a patient's infectiousness, a different matter from cure, which takes months, and from negative results for bacteriology examinations, direct and culture, which may take weeks, is very probably obtained after less than two weeks of treatment. As best I can tell, this is the first occurrence of the two-week rule as such. Now, this was a paper, a group of authors, who said, looks to us like two weeks ought to be enough. Um, and these facts seem to indicate a very rapid and powerful action of the drugs on infectivity. But if two weeks is it said less than two weeks, do we have any better handle on exactly how much less than two weeks? And that is the point of the next slide. Well, actually, um, slide after this. So based on these studies, there were many policies generated in the United States by the American Thoracic Society, CDC, which recommended uh, that you could treat MDR, you could treat TB, not MDR-TB, in the general hospital, there were guidelines for discharging patients and for sending people back to work, again, all based around that two-week rule. Uh, another point of view, as I mentioned, is from Dick Menzies. Um, again, uh, he assumes that smear positive does equal infectious, um, but no reported outbreaks from sources on therapy. There's one case in his paper that's mentioned of somebody who started therapy. Uh, homeless person and then infected some people in the emergency room, but that's all we could find. Um, for the Madras study, he said maybe there was high rates in the community that made no difference. All the U.S. studies were, may have involved patient selection, maybe they sent home the less, least infectious patients, but you know, I showed you one paper where they sent home quite a few smear positive and culture positive patients and concluded that smear positive patients should be considered infectious after two weeks. So again, a different point of view. I don't agree with this. More recently than that, uh, in 2010, a paper from Peru showed that in patients who are apparently cured, they may have lingering um, smear positivity and should be considered infectious. Again, I don't agree with that either, uh, but uh, I'll show you why. So in terms of when patients become non-infectious, we need to go to this uh, experimental setup that uh, Dr. Richard Riley did in the late 50s, early 60s in Baltimore, Maryland, where he had six patient beds, you're only seeing one, and all the air went to a penthouse above, this was in the VA hospital in Baltimore, and all the air went to the penthouse, and here we have hundreds of guinea pigs in these cages, and guinea pigs are highly susceptible to tuberculosis. So the air would go up here, and if the and the guinea pigs would be skin tested each month, and you could tell uh, each month how many patients, how many guinea pigs were infected by these patients, and by co connecting the drug susceptibility and by the timing, in most cases, uh, Dr. Riley and his team could figure out which patients infected which guinea pigs. We'll, as you'll see, we're doing similar experiments in South Africa today. In his first year, they're going along, and I apologize for the, uh, how difficult this is to see, but I'll point out some things. This is 1956, 1957, 1958 here, and the bars represent the number of guinea pigs that are infected. And he predicted uh, that they'd average around three, and you see three and maybe six, and probably four and uh, five, uh, and, and then for a period of time, for four months actually, there were no guinea pigs infected at all. And they wondered what was going wrong because they kept admitting to the patients who had smear positive cavitary tuberculosis, strongly smear positive cavitary tuberculosis. They really wanted to study transmission and suddenly transmission stopped despite having six patients on those wards with highly 
um, likely to be infectious, no transmission was occurring. Later they found out that all the patients who had previously been infected had been chronic patients, essentially treatment failures, and even though they were being treated with INH, streptomycin, PAS, uh, they were being inadequately treated. Then suddenly they admitted patients who were drug susceptible and transmission completely stopped. And I'll get to the point of this in just one minute after I show you his second two-year experiment. So in the second two years, knowing that or suspecting that transmission was going to be stopped by treatment, he admitted some patients who remained untreated for a while, both drug resistant and drug susceptible. Now the drug resistant could be resistant to INH, streptomycin, or PAS, but those were the only drugs available. So not truly MDR uh, TB, but on the other hand, almost closer to XDRTB because if you're resistant to INH and say streptomycin and were being treated with only PAS, you really were uh, not being very well treated at all. But at any rate, let's focus on the drug susceptible. 61 patients were untreated and infected 29 guinea pigs, recalling that 100%. Uh, 29 patients were treated and they were treated on the very day they went into the facility. They infected one guinea pig. These had, were included by the same criteria, highly uh, smear positive, cavitary coughing patients. So starting treatment the very day of admission reduced infectivity by 98%. The very day. This is not after two weeks, not after one week, not even after two days. This was uh, the effect of the same day of treatment. The same event, the same phenomenon is probably occurring with drug resistance resistant TB, but number one, the drug resistant TB patients seem to be less infectious, although their numbers were small, and variability in infectiousness is, is, is a big feature of TB, but the 11 patients who were treated seem to be less infectious than those who were not. Uh, as you'll see, Dr. Riley doesn't really want to uh, rely on those small numbers. So, and again, I'll read this quote because it's that important. The treatment of patients, uh, the treated patient were admitted to the ward at the time treatment was initiated, not weeks before, and were generally removed before the sputum became completely negative. Hence, a decrease in infectiousness preceded the elimination of organisms from the sputum, indicating the effect as prompt as well as striking. And here he talks about drug resistant TB, again, isonized and streptomycin PAS only, but the data are too few to uh, really focus on. So what's going on? Um, here's one idea. Uh, Loudon speculated uh, that when a droplet forms, it contains respiratory secretions that have antibiotic in them. And as the droplets evaporate into droplet nucleus, the concentration of drugs skyrockets, and that the tiny droplets, which are small enough to be transmitted by the airborne route, contain very high concentrations of antibiotic that might inhibit the ability to infect. But if you cough into a cup, which is how we do sputum tests, as you know, it's quite different. So sputum's culture versus guinea pig infection. Here we're talking about a whole sputum sample. There's no evaporation. There's no aerosol damage. There's no host defenses. Growth is supported. Growth support is optimized in culture. So you may have a positive smear, positive culture. But in the case of infecting guinea pigs or infecting other people, there's evaporation. There's this high drug concentration. There are host defenses. Uh, in, in both humans and guinea pigs, uh, innate immunity. So it's possible to be smear and culture positive and still not be infectious, in, in my view. By the way, the paper supporting the work I'm, t I'm about to tell you about is being published in the Gray Journal of the Union uh, in September. Uh, Rod Escom did a similar guinea pig study in 2008. And interestingly, he found a very similar phenomenon. Now we're talking about modern treatment of uh, tuberculosis. And he had 97 HIV positive patients who exposed 292 guinea pigs over 500 days. 66 were smear positive, uh, I'm sorry, culture positive, 35 were smear positive. 122 of 125 guinea pigs were infected by nine unsuspected. MDR patients. So the drug susceptible patients on treatment accounted for only 
three infections, one each. Two had delayed treatment, one had treatment stopped. So the message of this slide is exactly as Riley showed, is that uh, transmission to guinea pigs occurred primarily from uh, patients who were on inadequate treatment. So I'd like to offer a, a question for your response. Which of the following statements is false? TB treatment stops, uh, TB transmission stops within two weeks of starting effective treatment, true or false. Uh, hospitalization is required for treating newly diagnosed drug susceptible TB patients until smear negative. Or community based treatment of MDR TB, usually without hospitalization, is common practice in Peru, Cambodia. Lesotho, Kaziat, and many other settings. Okay, so hospitalization is not required. And I will go to my correct answer, which, of course, you're all right. Um, you don't need to hospitalize patients with drug susceptible TB. That may seem obvious to you. Uh, we recently admitted to the patient here a patient here with the uh, tuberculosis, a physician uh, in Boston, and um, the health department was very upset with me because I did not keep her in the hospital, even though she was started on therapy. So that may be obvious, but it is still remains uh, controversial. So what about MDRTB um, treatment? So we have a similar facility to Dr. Riley's and Dr. Escom's in uh, Pumalanga province, South Africa. Here is the MDR TB ward. Part of it has six patient rooms, one, two, four, six beds, and a corridor. And we send all the air not to the upstairs, but to an adjacent area that the patients can't see, where there are hundreds of, of guinea pigs that we can test each month for infection. We admit patients. Uh, many of them are HIV positive, but many of them still have cavitary lung disease. And you can see these. These are typical x-rays showing sometimes extensive disease, sometimes more limited disease, but often with cavities, as you can see in these x-rays. Um, but again, smear positive, cavitary coughing, and, either, and recently started on therapy. So far, we've done about six or seven experiments, but what you see here are four of them, five of them, actually. And here are the number of patients involved. And again, smear positive, cavitary coughing, started on therapy how long the exposures last, and how many uh, in the control arm, that is no interventions, uh, of the guinea pigs got infected. And in the first experiment, we were quite amazed that 74% of 360 guinea pigs were infected, many of them, about a third of them, in the first month. This was much more infection than Riley had ever seen. And then the next experiment, like Riley, we were really disappointed that suddenly the 74% with 24 new patients with the same criteria, now only 10% of the of 90 guinea pigs became infected. And then in the next month, we're back up to 53%. And then this remarkable experiment three, 27 patients admitted for MDRTB, smear positive, cavitary coughing, recently started on therapy for three months, and one guinea pig is infected, 1% infection rate. And then finally, for this last experiment, again, under control conditions, no interventions, 17 patients admitted three months, and now 77% of the guinea pigs get infected. Well, TB is quite variable in transmission, but it's hard to explain how we admit 27 patients to the hospital over three months, and we can't get more than one guinea pig infected. We were scratching our heads over this one. And then we got learned that in that first experiment, we isolated organisms from the guinea pigs and from the patients. And when we matched them by spoligotyping, the only, uh, only two spoligotypes transmitted, and both were associated with unsuspected XDRTB. So now the story begins to sound similar. If you treat everyone for MDRTB, it's the unsuspected XDRTB, which is not being adequately treated which is available for transmission. In experiment three, where we had 27 patients over three months, by chance alone, we had zero XDRTB, and there was very little transmission. In other words, in 
all those 27 patients, treatment for MDRTB started very soon after the uh, admission was effective in stopping transmission. So the overall message is captured here on an MDRTB ward where everyone has MDRTB, everyone is on MDR treatment, those who are available for transmission have unsuspected XDRTB. We plan to do more studies prospectively. These were all retrospective observations. Again, this will be published in September in the Gray Journal. But we will now prospectively admit patients with XDRTB for sure and various forms of pre-XDRTB to see if we can nail down for MDRTB what drugs are responsible. We suspect the fluoroquinolone drugs is key in stopping MDR transmission, but we don't know that for sure. How effective the ejectables are, we don't know. Um, personally, they don't have very, um, you know, they don't have a measurable EBA, early bactericidal activity, the injectables. So I suspect that the fluoroquinolones are doing the job, but uh, we'll see. In any case, I don't think the treatment impacts XDR transmission, or we don't have proof of that. We will generate that kind of proof when we do this study uh, in going forward. So the conclusions of this part of the talk, and then we're going to get the FAST, is that airborne transmission may be the weak link in TB propagation. Only about one in three patients with pulmonary TB infect close contacts. Very little effective treatment may tip the balance against transmission. Sputum smear positivity correlates with infectiousness only in inadequately treated patients. There's a strong rationale for the prompt diagnosis of drug resistance and the and prompt and effective treatment. And this treatment, if patients are on effective therapy, can be in the community. So question two. Which statement is incorrect? In Riley's classic guinea pig experiments, this was one in Baltimore, effective treatment stopped transmission almost immediately. In Escambi's guinea pig study in Peru, most infections were caused by unsuspected, inadequately treated MDRTB. And in my own study in South Africa, where all the patients were treated with MDR, for MDRTB, transmission appeared to be from unsuspected, untreated, drug susceptible TB. As you all correctly answered, this statement is false. Uh, obviously, again, what we found was most of the transmission occurred from unsuspected XDRTB, and that treatment for MDRTB stopped transmission of that. So now I'd like to move on to uh, a concept we're calling FAST, and here you see the logo. Much of this work has been supported by USAID, and I'd like to thank Elizabeth, my colleague at Partners in Health, Elizabeth Barrera, for her work in, 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 in developing this concept as well. And uh, you'll see some preliminary data that she's gathered in Bangladesh. So the underlying principle uh, of FAST is that most TB transmission is not due to known or suspected patients on effective therapy. You've just seen how effective therapy uh, stops transmission. Much of, uh, however, traditional TB infection control focuses on known or suspected cases, where they should be isolated, how many air changes should occur or separated, um, whether you should wear respiratory protection, whether those respirators need to be fit tested. I would argue that that's all secondary. If you have people on effective therapy, none of that is important. The key word is effective. Rapid identification of unsuspected TB cases and unsuspected drug resistance are the absolute top priorities in infection control. Effective treatment rapidly stops TB transmission regardless of smear status. So, what does FAST stand for? Find TB cases actively. Separate and treat. Find TB cases by rapid diagnostics, so we're, we're endorsing the WHO endorsement of expert TB or any other FAST test that follows it. But right now, that's the FAST test on the, on the block. Lyproassays can be quick as well, but um, 
the test that we're speaking about right now is expert. Sputum smear can also be fast, but it's more limited. It doesn't tell you, it's not as sensitive as expert, and it doesn't tell you about drug susceptibility. Active case finding focuses on cough surveillance. You can't transmit, by and large, if you don't cough. So active case finding. Separation is temporarily, really because you're, it takes some time to orchestrate uh, treatment, not shouldn't take long. And you know this engages with building design and engineering and cough hygiene. Um, but um, all of that is should be a, a short-term proce process because treatment's going to take over. Treat effectively based on a rapid DST, taking us back to the rapid diagnostics, rapid molecular DST. If you have to wait three months to find out that somebody has MDRTB, you can't control MDRTB. You must know about that in hours to days uh, in order to prevent transmission. So just to emphasize, traditional infection control, as I've outlined it, is has to do with having a tuberculosis infection control plan, political will, an infection control committee, and administrative environmental respiratory protections, assessment. All of what we're talking about, a FAST, fits under administrative controls. And the, I'm not going to go into detail of how you implement FAST, but you can imagine that the things we're focusing on is the our processes and process indicators. The amount of time that elapses in a general medical setting from the time a patient enters that building until the time that cough is detected and sputum is collected. From the time sputum is collected to it gets to the lab. From the time it gets to the lab to you get the result. From the time you get the result to you are notified. And from the time of notification to the implementation of effective treatment. In the case of a TB hospital or a chest hospital where everybody has cough or respiratory symptoms, suddenly the focus of uh, FAST changes from rapid D to rapid DST testing get people on effective therapy without waiting for months for traditional uh, drug susceptibility, for patients to fail therapy or for drug, traditional DSTs to occur. Um, another indicator, in addition to these processes, are the amount of transmission that occurs to healthcare workers, although that has not been uh, actually done yet in, in any place that I know of. As far as FAST is concerned, we are attempting to do it in Peru. A uh, FAST is being implemented in many places. Uh, Zambia is making an attempt, Nigeria, Bangladesh, I'll show, tell you more about that, Vietnam, Peru, Russia, and most recently Haiti is uh, looking at implementing FAST. And in some cases it's in TB hospitals, and in some cases it's in general hospitals. Through Partners in Health, thanks to funding from USAID, materials are available to help with FAST implementation, uh, guidance on terms of how to do it, uh, signage, etc. However, this is not an educational program. This is not like washing your hands, where you want to get the general population to do this. You need to identify people who are going to be cough officers, who, whose job it is to identify coughing patients. You've got to streamline the process of getting patients um, to uh, collect sputum and get that sputum to the lab and the results back. You've got to have access to rapid molecular diagnostics. So this is not an educational program per se. This is an implementation of streamlined processes. Here's some preliminary results from the National Institute of Disease of, of the Chest in a uh, hospital in Dhaka, Bangladesh, thanks to my colleague Elizabeth Barrera. And again, because this is a chest hospital and everybody comes in with respiratory symptoms, this is not about cough surveillance or undiagnosed, but it is und about undiagnosing uh, unsuspected TB and unsuspected MDR-TB. And so people who come with a current TB diagnosis using this FAST approach, they've been able to identify uh, a, an additional 7% uh, MDR-TB on patients who were not suspected of having MDR-TB. Among patients who come in with other respiratory diseases uh, with a previous TB history, they found uh, that almost a quarter of them had unsuspected TB, maybe it should have been suspected, and some had also unsuspected MDR-TB. And patients who were 
admitted with other respiratory uh, diseases. Uh, there was also about a 10% incidence of TB and, uh, and several, and of course this is the largest number, uh, and also several with uh, unsuspected MDR-TB. Overall, 10,062 patients had specimens sent to Gene Expert for rapid diagnosis uh, soon after admission, and 11% had uh, unsuspected TB, and 1% had unsuspected MDR-TB. These patients would have been transmitting in that population, but now have the opportunity to institute rapid uh, treatment, which we uh, have shown you will stop transmission. So in summary, fast implementation leads to dramatic shortening of infectious period. You can't measure infectiousness easily, but you can measure the time periods from admission to effective therapy. And I would submit that these process indicators before and after implementation of FAST can easily document and serve for ongoing quality control and should be acceptable to funders as indication that you're doing something. Shortening the infectious period is clearly linked to transmission. And I think that is my last slide. And with that, I will stop and uh, be happy to take questions for the last 10 minutes. Oh, one more question. Um, in the FAST approach, active case finding can be accomplished by traditional liquid culture. Uh, in the FAST approach, the key measurement for efficacy are performance standards, such as time for entering the facility to cough detection, time to sputum collection, time to laboratory results, it is more important to uh, uh, treat TB patients effectively to stop transmission than to isolate them for two weeks until sputum conversion. And um, very good. Well, I, I fooled you a little bit, or I fooled some of you. I see some of you are changing your answers. Maybe it's just a matter of reading um, uh, and uh, questions that are asking for negatives may be confusing. So what I said was that liquid culture is, is adequate for the fast approach. But of course, you know that backpack takes at the shortest usually two weeks, maybe seven days to get some growth, but two weeks uh, may take three weeks to get a result. That's not fast enough. Um, so really, to do, adequately do uh, this fast approach, you need to have rapid molecular testing. Um, you can do it with expert. In Peru, because the laboratory is set up to do it, we're going to be doing it with lime probe assay. Again, if it's two hours or if it's even two days, that's a dramatic improvement over business as usual in terms of waiting to find out you have um, either unsuspected TB or unsuspected drug resistance. So with that, now we'll take any discussion and questions you have. hospitalization, uh, should they be separated from other patients? Um, well, uh, I think that depends. Um, you know, it, it, it makes no sense uh, to have a newly diagnosed TB patient next to patients with uh, HIV or with, um, uh, let's say, diabetes. And if you have the ability to separate, that would be great. Uh, if you don't have the ability to separate, knowing that someone's on effective therapy, emphasis on effective, is uh, goes a long way to stop transmission. So I'm hedging a little bit. Uh, not that I have any doubt that transmission is stopped by treatment, but there are factors, for example, which I haven't really mentioned. For what what if um, someone has vomiting and is not keeping their medication down? What if they've got the diarrhea and are not absorbing the drugs? So effective treatment means uh, effective treatment. And if uh, there is any possibility that um, they're really not getting treatment, they may remain infectious. Um, so all that needs to be considered, especially in the hospital.
Friday. Okay. Sounds like we are uh, out of questions. Yeah, it seems like uh, if there are any more questions, feel free to contact Dr. Naudel uh, or Elizabeth directly. Um, and I would like to sincerely thank you, Dr. Edward Nardell, for this very informative and interesting presentation. And I would also like to thank everyone for their participation.